Today, we look up at the stars and wonder if we are alone in the cosmos. In fantasy and science fiction, we wonder what it might be like to encounter other intelligent species that are similar to us, yet not the same. The Earth is a tiny dot in a vast universe surrounded by darkness, and our current understanding of physics suggests that we are confined to this small rock. Nevertheless, as far as we can determine, we are on our own in the universe. Life, especially intelligent life, seems to be extremely rare. Indeed, there is something very peculiar about our species, Homo sapiens sapiens. Unlike other animals, we do not have any brother or sister species to share our world. Lions have tigers, dolphins have porpoises, and horses have zebras. But humans are the only two-legged sentient primate on Earth. Is this evidence of intelligent design, or something more sinister? Over a century ago, French archaeologists discovered the Cro-Magnons, while Germans discovered Neanderthals, but Britain had nothing until the Piltdown Man emerged. It took decades to uncover the truth about Piltdown Man, Britain's greatest scientific deception. It's a fascinating narrative of intellectual and scientific dishonesty. Even though most scientists saw almost immediately that this was a crude forgery, it took the British Royal Society forty years to admit what everyone already knew. The shards of skull discovered in a gravel pit at Piltdown in East Sussex, England in 1912, were identified as the remains of a one-million-year-old ape-man with a huge brain but primitive jaw, bone and teeth. It was precisely what British scientists sought. Now, the British had their own fossil, but it was a counterfeit created from a modern human brain case and an orangutan jawbone. At the time of its discovery, there was a strong desire for Britain to have its own missing link, and many specialists who should have known better fell for the fraud. Most scientists now assume that local archaeologist Charles Dawson, who discovered the skull fragments first, was responsible for falsifying the find. He was keen to become a Royal Society Fellow and was considered a candidate for election. He hoped that the Piltdown skull would serve as his ticket to scientific stardom. But he died in 1916, not long after making his infamous discovery. A few years ago, the British Museum reviewed the material and decided that Dawson acted alone. However, they never discussed the fact that a member of the British Museum, Sir Arthur Smith Woodward, was also involved in the fraud. Well, what we've been able to show, I think pretty convincingly, is that the same pieces of ape jaw were used in two separate Piltdown sites. And what we've shown is that the tooth from the second Piltdown site, this tooth here, um, with a very high degree of certainty, came from the same jawbone that was found at Piltdown 1. Charles Dawson, who obviously is a main candidate as the hoaxer, he must have had the whole jaw in his possession. He modified it and planted it at Piltdown 1, and then he kept back part of it and modified and planted this molar at the Piltdown 2 site. If Dawson had been successful, he would not have been the first fraudster or crook to be admitted to the society. The Royal Society, formerly known as the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, is a learned society and the United Kingdom's official National Academy of Science. The society's slogan, Nullius in Verba, translates to take nobody's word for it. It was used to represent the fellow's commitment to establish facts by experiments and originates from Horace's epistles, where he compares himself to a gladiator who, having retired, is free from control. Nevertheless, it is startling to see how many eminent scientists and Royal Society fellows have been discredited. According to Keith Moore, the Royal Society's principal librarian, this type of behaviour has a lengthy history. Examples date back to the foundation of the Royal Society several hundred years ago. So, is this proof that the theory of evolution is a fraud? Is there proof that more ancient human fossils are fakes and part of a larger scientific conspiracy? In comparison to all those who had come before them, the modern human was so intellectually and genetically sophisticated, had such a large brain, and appeared so unexpectedly on earth, that they could have been made by God, and in the image of the gods, understanding good and evil. In fact, there was a new kind of entity on earth, and the modern human was an intellectual powerhouse. 
Human evolution is intrinsically interesting. It piques our interest in what came before our species, Homo sapiens. But where in our ancestry does human evolution begin? In other words, how far back in time must we travel to find our ancestors who were not human, but rather an ape walking on two legs? What are the requirements for being considered human? Getting to the bottom of this is more complicated than it seems. More than a century ago, scientists began classifying fossils based on whether they appeared to have looked and acted more like modern humans than ancient hominins, such as the ape-like Australopithecus afarensis, dubbed Lucy, who lived a few million years ago. Originally, anthropologists thought that traits like brain size and tool use would distinguish humans from earlier Australopithecines. In the years thereafter, fossil discoveries have challenged some of those notions. The narrative of humanity's inheritance of the Earth began five million years ago, when a group of African apes began to adapt to a lifestyle apart from forests, which were declining due to global environmental changes. These early hominids, most notably Australopithecus anamensis, afarensis, had small brains but upright postures. The oldest fossil in the R species comes from Ethiopia and dates back 2.8 million years. But many others completely disagree with this interpretation because the fossil is only half a mandible. We find evidence of their delicate two-legged movement in the extraordinary Laetoli steps, the prints of three Australopithecine apemen who strode over a field of hot volcanic sediments in East Africa 3.5 million years ago, leaving their footprints in the ashes of time. Nonetheless, these early relatives had only small, ape-sized brains and vegetarian lives until approximately 2.5 million years ago, when hints of intellectual prowess first appeared with the fabrication of the first stone tools. Homo habilis, or handy man, appeared roughly 300,000 years before the earliest known Homo erectus, and its membership in the Homo genus has been disputed, to say the least. Some scholars believe it is sufficiently ape-like to be classified as the Australopithecine, removing it from the human genus. What about cultural customs like burying the dead, painting pictures on cave walls, or using symbolic representations? The behavioural evidence is spotty. Early humans used tools throughout that time, but we don't know if they used fire, and we don't believe we're burying their dead or constructing symbolic representations of things. It is not until much later in the archaeological record that we see some of what we consider to be contemporary behaviours. The first human was most likely Homo erectus. These large, stocky humans made a significant contribution to human evolution. Estimates vary, but they are considered to have lived between 2 million and 100,000 years ago and were the first humans to leave Africa and spread over Europe and Asia. But they are credited with abstract thought as proven by an etched shell from half a million years ago. By this stage we've journeyed back a few million years in human history. Fossilised remains from this time period and earlier are extremely rare, and what is discovered is usually in fragments. It is rare to find a complete suite of evidence in a single fossil, so you'll get a piece of a skull, a bit of a hand, a bit of a pelvis, and a couple of teeth. But we're not sure how they'll fit together. Only later in the fossil record do we find nice, complete bones of a single Homo erectus. Then there are locations where we know numerous hominins lived at the same period, but the fossils and artefacts do not come with labels when they are excavated. There's also the fact that evolution occurs very gradually. There are so many various components of what makes us human, but they seldom arrive all at once. In Ethiopia's wastelands, stone tools two million years old were created by prehistoric humans, and two million years later, comparable, if slightly more advanced, tools were created by modern man. Walking upright usually comes first, followed by stone tools, and then we get giant brains, which should come as no surprise given that stone tools allow you to access a far broader range of resources, which helps your brain grow larger. So while there is no clear line in history between humans and apes, the earliest human, by modern standards, was most likely Homo erectus. Whether the most advanced form of Homo erectus evolved in Africa or Asia is still being debated. Nevertheless, a significant evolutionary change occurred two million years ago, when Homo erectus transitioned to more complex stone tools and behaviour. They were the first global travellers, 
and accomplished many things for the first time. If you were to travel back in time only a few tens of thousands of years, and there were other two-legged primates that looked very similar to humans moving across the earth. They included our closest cousins, Homo neanderthalensis, also known as Neanderthals, and the Denisovans, who some regard to be a sister lineage of Neanderthals. Their skeletons demonstrate that Neanderthals were strong and slightly shorter than humans, yet had a larger brain for their body size. The Denisovan picture is less clear. The entire documented suite of Denisovan fossils could be counted on two hands, but they most likely resembled Neanderthals. We don't know everything about Neanderthal behaviour, but it's becoming evident that they weren't the knuckle-dragging, club-wielding oafs portrayed in popular culture. They created tools and art, as well as symbolic behaviours, resulting in artefacts with uses other than just survival. You can find teeth that have been pierced, possibly for wearing or embellishing things, at locations that were closely linked with Neanderthals. So it appears that some fundamental abstraction and symbols were practiced, at least by the later Neanderthals. We don't know whether certain practices evolved within Neanderthal communities or were copied when they interacted with Homo sapiens. Nonetheless, we do know that the notion that only Homo sapiens created art and engaged in what appears to be abstract thinking is losing traction. Along with fossils and other archaeological artefacts, vestiges of Neanderthals and Denisovans can be detected now as segments of DNA in our genome, remnants of interbreeding down the millennia, not just with us, but also with each other. So rather than viewing our species' evolution as a family tree, with branches splitting into two species before splitting again or becoming a dead end, consider it more like a braided stream, with several water channels diverging, flowing for a while and then rejoining. But how did modern humans unexpectedly inherit the planet at the expense of sibling species like the Neanderthals? Consider what happened when modern humans arrived in Europe some 40,000 years ago. We had to share it with the Neanderthals, who had been doing well there for at least 300,000 years. So did the Neanderthals perish as a result of species cleansing by Rambo-like thugs carrying cutting-edge long-range weapons? Or did it happen more gradually? Within 5,000 years of our arrival, we had made the Neanderthals extinct, yet they were our closest cousins. Of course, they shared the same habitats as us, so they were the first to go. That much is apparent. Homo sapiens would have been a deadly foe if they had improved linguistic abilities and the ability to use mental symbols when solving problems. A creature armed with symbolic skills is a formidable competitor, and not necessarily an entirely rational one, as the rest of the living world has discovered. Neanderthals had little to give contemporary humans besides competition. The mindset may have been to fire your arrow first and ask questions later. In view of the Neanderthals' ludicrously rapid extinction and the following record of Homo sapiens, we can conclude that such interactions were rarely pleasant for the former. Neanderthals had run out of places to hide. The hypothesis of Stone Age warfare is difficult to substantiate, given paleontologists have found no Neanderthal skeletons riddled with arrowheads. Nonetheless, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that our encounters with Neanderthals were frequently violent and lethal. Indeed, humans are a uniquely dangerous species. If our ancestors shared our constructive instincts, they most likely shared our destructive ones as well. By 100,000 years ago, natural selection had produced three distinct types of humans, big-brained Neanderthals in Europe, a separate population of erectus-like humans who scientists now believe lingered around Java and Homo sapiens in Africa. The stage was prepared for our manifest destiny, modern humans surged out of Africa and into Eurasia, eradicating any indigenous human species that stood in their way. At the very least, this is the official story. For far too long we have dismissed the disappearance of Neanderthals as a random historical accident. Rather, when Neanderthals and modern humans couldn't coexist, their extinction may have been caused by the modern human race's earliest and most successful extinction campaign. The dismal vision of Homo sapiens is aptly expressed in the words of Agent Smith in The Matrix. Every mammal on our planet finds a natural harmony with its surroundings, but you humans do not.
One theory holds that a species may engage in such annihilation due to expansionist motivations, greed, paranoia, territoriality and aggressiveness. According to the theory, every species is an armed hunter, lurking like a ghost among the trees, delicately pulling aside branches and silently attempting to advance. If he finds another sentient species, he has only one option. Eliminate them. Other intelligent beings are what make this wilderness dangerous, and it is an eternal threat that all intelligent life forms will be wiped out of existence. This fact explains why humans are the only intelligent life on Earth. And with that, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, please subscribe and leave a comment and watch our other videos. We appreciate your support.